The biggest challenge facing the British NHS, it seems to me, over the next few years uh, is a word that begins with F. Uh, it's not the word you're thinking of. It's not healthcare finance. It's actually fear. Uh, and it's fear of a particular kind. Now, one of the things that, we, uh, th that we've learned over, over 20 odd years of healthcare reform is that on the whole, most hospitals, most institutions, most poorly performing institutions in the public sector, I mean, not just hospitals, but schools, children's services, on, on, don't reform themselves. It seems very difficult. The basket cases of today are very often the basket cases um, that were around 10 years ago, even 20 years ago. Uh, and again, this applies across a very wide range of uh, public sector institutions. Uh, now, they don't reform themselves, and it is necessary to have some form, some form of challenge, some form of external challenge. Now, where should that challenge come from? Or where? Now, we've tried um, in Britain a number of different sources of challenge. Uh, the most prominent one, uh, the first was targets, targets and performance management, or targets and terror, as it became known. Um, very effective in many ways, um, uh, certainly at least in achieving the things that were targeted, um, but with a number of uh, toxic side effects. Uh, the toxicity emerges in a variety of ways. It emerges uh, through um, concentrating uh, resources on the thing that's targeted and neglecting the things that are not targeted. Uh, it, it appears uh, in the, but more fundamentally, I think, it appears in the uh, demotivation and the demoralization uh, and the fear, indeed, that is generated um, among, the, uh, uh, among the people uh, and the institutions that are targeted. Um, we tried competition uh, as a challenge. That's a ch challenge coming from one's peers or one's peer institutions or whatever. Um, that uh, uh, I'm a known advocate of and uh, still uh, remain so. I think we're, we're actually seeing um, something of a diminution of competition because of the merger mania that is going on in many parts of the uh, many parts of, of the world, um, not just uh, in the UK, particularly in the United States, actually, understand. Um, very interesting work come out from the King's Fund recently, um, looking at all the evidence on mergers and showing that they almost invariably fail. Um, in fact, I think actually invariably fail. Uh, I think I find it very difficult to find even one example of a successful merger. Um, each time we have a merger, it reduces competitive pressure, reduces the source of challenge. Uh, from there. And so the government is increasingly uh, resorting to the third form of challenge, which is that from the regulator, or I should say in the NHS case, from the regulators. Um, some specialist hospital uh, chief exec was telling me the other day that he's subject to 63 different regulators. I haven't been able to confirm that number, but nonetheless, it's a very large number. Uh, and uh, it's uh, and I think it's an extremely dangerous uh, route to go down. The, um, the disadvantages of regulation, are much, uh, as, a, as a form of challenge, are very similar to the disadvantages of targets and performance management. Uh, they create, they ha it has toxic side effects, and particularly in terms of the demoralization and the demotivation um, of the people being regulated. Um, we're moving into an era, uh, an era of overregulation, uh, and, uh, and the consequence is a massive degree of fear, of fear spreading through, through the health service. Um, Scott has told us that um, we should not um, learn any lessons from the United States. However, um, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt said at the time of the, uh, the Great Depression, uh, we should not, the only thing we have to fear is fear it, uh, itself. This, I think, is a very useful lesson that the NHS could learn for the future in dealing with our Great Recession. Thank you. Um, it's often said, um, and indeed I've said it myself on a number of occasions, that the problem of the fair and efficient allocation of resources in healthcare stems from the fact of scarcity. And I'd like to use this splendid and notable occasion, this 10th birthday party for Heppel, uh, publicly to repent of this heresy. A heresy that I suspect may be shared by the majority of people uh, in this room. I'm going to suggest to you that the problem of the fair and efficient allocation of resources is not 
one of scarcity. It is, in some systems at least, a problem of shortages, a problem that is likely to affect some systems that are highly centralised in their organisation and finance, and therefore I think it is a problem for the NHS. How far it's a problem for other systems, I think, is a matter for empirical investigation. Now, this distinction between scarcity and shortages goes back to a literature which I think few people read these days, but it is nonetheless an important one, namely the economics of planned economies. Alec Nove pointed out that administrative planners can only feasibly substitute their judgment about priorities for production when they are aware of the social value of each product in terms of the foregone production of one line of activity that is incurred by the production of another line of activity. This does not simply mean that they have to be aware of the costs of producing certain types of goods in general, for example, that of footwear or agricultural machinery. Rather, they must know the costs of production associated with specific kinds of shoes or plows. And a similar lesson can be gleaned from German experience between 1936 and 1948, as noted by the great uh, German economist Walter Eucken, actually, I think, in a set of lectures that were to be given um, at the LSE, where he pointed to the concept of administratively suppressed inflation. To suppress inflation, the authorities started to control prices, leading to shortages that, in turn, had to be dealt with by those same administrators. In particular, where raw materials for production could not be introduced in sufficient quantities to meet demand, then the authorities had to ration the supply of those materials according to their own priorities. In such a situation, the business decisions of producing units uh, become incalculable, since no one operating an enterprise can plan on the basis of the availability of material for production or take advantage of the flexibility of the price system at the margin. Now, both of these analyses distinguish scarcity from shortages. Scarcity exists when demand that is unlimited by price or by rationing exceeds supply. Scarcity, in this sense, is the economic problem outside a utopian fantasy of economic abundance. Shortages, by contrast, exist when individuals, whether private consumers or enterprise managers, cannot obtain what they want or need, even though they have the money. Under planning, shortages are endemic. In the UK, the planned administrative suppression of inflation is variously known as efficiency savings by the Treasury, the Nicholson Challenge by managers, and the cuts by the public. To be sure, efficiency savings can be presented as compatible with decentralised decision-making, since they ostensibly leave the implementation of the savings to local bodies who are supposed to have their own priorities within an overall budget limit. However, this appearance is misleading. Efficiency savings are necessarily a crude planning framework, and in situations in which hospitals have few other sources of revenue, car parking, fatty food outlets, and charges for copies of pregnancy scans come to mind. They lead to shortages of beds, convalescent facilities, and staff. When centrally determined targets are superimposed upon the financial constraints through the targeting regime, shortages are made worse, even when local populations would be collectively willing to pay more. This problem is not solved by economic analyses that identify the marginal cost-effectiveness ratios of interventions, for example, the analyses conducted by NICE, since they do not look at the total cost implications of all appraised interventions. So using such a decision procedure is inflationary, uh, as NICE's recommendations on statin in 2014, I think, well illustrates. Now, in making these points, I'm not, of course, advocating a replacement of collective universal health coverage by market mechanisms. The problems associated with such mechanisms are well known. However, I am suggesting a research and policy agenda in which the balance between the centralised administrative determination of priorities and the decentralised processes of budget setting and revenue raising is absolutely fundamental to the agenda. Perhaps there already are systems in which a feasible and well-functioning form of this balance has been found. If so, I would be interested to hear them. 
Where does that leave the idea of scarcity? Well, it seems to me that the standard economic paradigm makes scarcity and budget limits evils to be overcome. But limits, whether budgetary limits or the limits of the discipline of professional practice, are just what gives meaning to life. Just think of how boring tennis would be if you simply removed the net, if you removed that limit. Just think how boring this would be if Adam had not set us all the limit of five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the problem of healthcare is not to find a form of organization in which limits are removed. It is to find a form of organization in which the meaningful limits of human finitude are not necessarily burdened by the artificial limits of misbegotten priorities determined by central planners. Thank you, Albert. Thank you.